things. Now I've got this software. I'm going to try it out today. Haven't used it before. Um, so we'll just see how it goes. Let me sort myself out here. What I can do is I can um, change the the scene. And you guys, I want to be able to see that. And you guys should should now be able to see the scene that I'm seeing. But is it reversed for you? It does appear that it's reversed. Can somebody confirm that? <laughs> that it appears backwards to you? <laughs> somebody see that? I'm going to try to fix that before we go on. Can you read the web page that I'm on, or does it look backwards? I think it may look No, it's OK. Oh, it's OK. We can read it. Oh, yes. OK. No, that's good. It does look backwards to the image that's um, showing to me, so that's a little jarring. All right, so um, well, what we're looking at is um, we're looking at a GitHub um, account that I started, and it's the one I demonstrated the GitHub web pages of a few weeks ago. And if you click on the GitHub web page, I'll just drop it in the chat here. Um, this will be the new home of the um, GitHub for Herig, the website for Herig, and the website for the new Python group. And if you click on the um, Herig link, it will take you to our our website. And so. Um, I'm going to try to keep up with this. It should be a lot easier for me to keep up with than the um, than the old Opera Genetic website that was on WordPress. And also, I wanted to, you know, poke the system with a sharp stick a little bit and see what was possible. So for today, we're continuing the R boot camp. We are. Um, I've uploaded uh, a markdown. Um, document of the slides that I'll use. I'm going to go through a few slides first. This is just a link to the boot camp page that we're going to go through today. Um, and I've put up an optional reading that you can read a little bit later that it, it's mentioned on the web page. And uh, but for most of the time today, what I want to do is um, spend it uh, going through and actually doing the boot camp. Um, and at the end, there's an exercise and I'll tell you about that in just a moment. So I'm just going to Bring up the slides. And I can change the scene. There we go. OK. So what we're doing today is the very first official, the full boot camp page. It's probably the easiest page. And um, if, if we find that this is too easy for everybody, we can probably manage to do a second page, although I've only um, I'm only prepared to do one. OK, now if you're a brand new R user, um, you may not have heard me talk about this before, but for everyone else, I'm just going to go ahead and um, I see someone has started recording. And I'm just going to back up one slide and I'm going to start a local recording because I also want to try a system with the recordings. I should explain that. Um, over time, I think I've just about cracked the case on how Teams works for for these Teams meetings. And if I send a, um, a calendar invitation for these meetings, as long as I've invited you and you've accepted my invitation, you have access to the chat and to the um, to the recordings that we're making in this this Teams chat. But um, unless we do some admin to that, other people who haven't been invited and accepted don't have access to it. And um, I haven't really done any um, admin for this. I don't. I didn't see it. Didn't see who started it. Thank you, whoever did do that. But um, Magda sometimes does it. Anna sometimes does it. And um, who who did start it? <laughs> thank you. Me, it was oh, me. thank you, Juliana. Um, I think there's some admin to um, make sure that everybody who wants to, who has the link, could access this. And I think that is possible, but I want to try something today where I record it locally and uh, have a little more control about it. So I'll, I'll record this today, and then I'll upload it. I just want to see how it works. I'm just testing a few things out. So I'm also going to start a local recording now. 
and uh, then I'll go on. So this this is just a few slides that I have that will um, introduce the bootcamp 1.1, which is on the syntax basics of R, and it and it goes through a couple of uh, just core skills, day one skills when using R. And if you've been to some of these meetings before, uh, or if you've used um, R with me before, you probably will have, will have heard me use the metaphor of the passive aggressive butler, or maybe this is new to you. So uh, when we're learning R syntax basics and we're learning R for um, in the early days, I like to think of the R interpreter, and I make a distinction between um, R as a as a noun that is the pro programming language, and uh, R that is the program that um, is what we might call an interpreter that takes the R syntax that you pass to it and uh, translates it to um, to a language that computers understand and then acts on it to do work for us. So we we might refer to that as the uh, R interpreter. And uh, sometimes you can make mistakes, as you know, when you're when you're using a computer programming language. So um, if you make a mistake, most interpreters for most programming languages will give you some feedback. They'll they'll yell at you or admonish you in some way. And uh, sometimes that feedback is very helpful. Oh, yes, I made a mistake. Thank you for that error message. I'll just get straight to it. But sometimes it's not so easy. Um, and this is where the passive aggressive butler comes in. So uh, if you if you do something that's a mistake and the butler tells you that's a mistake, it might be helpful. Sometimes you'll do something that's a mistake and the butler will tell you you've made a mistake but the feedback might not be so helpful. You, you haven't been helped. And uh, sometimes you'll make a mistake and the butler won't say anything at all. And uh, in, in this way, I like to treat the interpreter and syntax uh, pretty seriously, um, especially in the early days, and really pay attention to those, those help messages until we come to terms with the passive aggressive butler. So um, here's what we're going to work on today. We're going to work on um, some uh, script basics for uh, for setting up a um, an R script. Some best practice basics. We're going to. I'm just going to increase the screen here since I'm still working on this stuff. There we go. That might update for you guys. Um, we're going to work on the basics of uh, the operators that do mathematics functions in R. This is this is day one kind of stuff. Uh, in fact, looking in the chat, a lot of you have already done this. Uh, and if it is too easy, I have a backup um, plan, which I'll tell you about in just a moment. We'll look at um, Boolean operators or logical operators. These are true, false, zero, one, TF, um, yes, no. Um, data and operators to handle them. So sometimes called logical operators, sometimes called Boolean operators. It's a bit of computer lingo, but we use them quite regularly uh, as normal scientists too. Make a note. Um, I'll say something about base R versus the tidyverse. Uh, and when we get to it, um, I've thought about this problem now in depth and uh, I've explicitly um, experimented with it pedagogically and I I've definitely come down on one side of the fence I have it won't be a surprise to anyone in here which side of the fence I'm on especially for new learners of R but we can talk about it a little bit um, and then if, if this stuff goes really fast today um, at the end of every single boot camp page there are some exercises and we'll do the exercises today now for this first page um, some of the exercises may be very easy if you if you've already if you're past your first day using R. Uh, but every single page invites you for one of the exercises to write your own exercise, and um, I think that uh, that'll give enough space for us to fill up the hour if we do that. Okay, so. Um, just as a reminder, I have already mentioned this, and I'll probably repeat this most weeks, is that um, 
if you're wanting to build your skills, even if you are experienced, um, one of the things that's a bottleneck in in uh, any kind of programming, but building scripts for R, I'd say there are two principal bottlenecks. One is that um, you uh, you know what you want to type, and you you type it in. That's a bottleneck. Um, or maybe there's a bottleneck where um, you know what you want to do, but you don't know exactly what to type. Um, and I guess there is a third kind of bottleneck is that you have typed something, but it doesn't work. And so you have to change it. And uh, you, you come back to those first two kinds. You either know what to type and you have to type it to change it, or you, you have to figure out how to type it. For all of those, for all of those um, bottlenecks in developing an analysis or writing code, um, we may think about the value in just practicing typing. So to get the most out of the boot camp for every single page uh, and every single bit of code, I recommend that you, you run every line of code, even if it's a comment uh, in your own browser, uh, your own copy of our, our studio locally. And uh, second, this is harder for most people to come to terms with, but I recommend that you type every single character for every single command, even comments that you find in this boot camp. You'll be a better typist. You'll be a better coder. You'll find your own typos uh, if you do that. So I will mention it every time. Uh, obviously, I can't force you to do that, but you'll get more out of the boot camp if you do do it. One of the things that uh, I introduce in this very first page, because I think is quite important, um, and th this is not, this has nothing to do with computer coding. As a matter of fact, I don't think it's for the vast majority of people who might come to the R groups here. Merely learning to code is uh, is you don't even have to worry about that. It's not even an important skill to to most people. But what you do have to um, think about is to create a an analysis that's reproducible as a as a matter of day-to-day uh, -day work and best practice in a, in the um, short term it creates a little hurdle for you to learn the elements of good practice to implement them but in the even in the the medium term and certainly the long term it will be much easier for you later if you if you develop these habits so one of the um, one of the habits I would like to suggest to you is uh, that the habit of um, of uh, elements of a script, or I, I refer to them in the boot camp as um, code chunks. And uh, these comments, commented out um, chunks here, are the first two code chunks which should appear in every single script you ever write. I, I have my own style. This is my my syntax for these two code chunks. Um, if you think you can um, make a better one, or if you think you make one that you prefer over mine, that's totally fine. An important thing for best practice, though, is to be consistent in uh, how you construct these code chunks. So one of them that should be in your script, whether or not you have exactly this format or not, doesn't really matter, but there should be a header present in some form in every script, even a small trivial one that you write. Um, the header, um, it's a little hokey uh, to to literally explicitly label the header because the, all the header is, uh, it's, a, it's a word that describes an area at the top of scripts or programs that uh, has a little information about the contents of the script or program. And at minimum, it should say who the who the coder is, or at least who the most recent editor is. Um, in this one, I've put a little bit of um, information about the um, location on the web of the boot camp, uh, what, what it is. It's a page. It's 1.1 in the boot camp syntax. And I, I like to have a running date of when the date last edited is. And I like to have that ANSI ISO date standard of uh, the year dash the month that dash the day uh, that is you know universally and internationally accepted and standardized. Getting some messages on Teams right now that are popping up and um, messing with my screen. 
Okay. So um, the second co-chunk is a contents section. I, I think a contents section for an analysis script is very important. Um, of course, for a script that you make, um, the contents will be unique for every uh, for every script that you write. But even if you only have one or two contents um, um, headers here, this is an important code chunk for me because, uh, well, at least in R, my current workflow, and I, I think it is best practice for um, for any workflow, but uh, I would I would I'm still looking for someone to improve on an organization system like this is that uh, I, I like to list the main uh, sections that will exist in the rest of the script and create a structure for the rest of my script. So this gives a roadmap for myself in the future when I look at this analysis at some future time, uh, or it creates a roadmap when I um, collaborate with somebody, maybe more than one person, and, and any amount of time could happen. So within these two sections anybody who you've never met who um who you've never told about your research should be able to open up read the header and read the table of contents and have a pretty good idea about what is in the script why it was written what it's going to accomplish and so forth another little thing that i'll i'll demonstrate in a few moments with these code chunks and we practice them um uh, I may mention them a little bit in the um, boot camp, but I will demonstrate it. And it's certainly best practice, and it's it's a staple part, a core part of my workflow. Uh, and that's this syntax. I, I think I demonstrated it last week, um, even, and I've mentioned it multiple times in here. And a lot of us are already using this, where in R uh, and R Studio, you can create a clickable table of contents with the syntax of starting a line with a hash um, symbol and ending it with at least four hash symbols. And it creates a clickable link to navigate quickly through even quite long scripts. It really, really helps even on short scripts. So uh, I've got a template script that we go through in this first boot camp that demonstrates that. I've already emphasized uh, this point to uh, type it yourself, but I wanted to emphasize another aspect of this is that um, that it's a little bit of a uh, it's kind of a joke I mean everyone that I know including myself for sure um, will recycle code but I make a distinction between merely copying and pasting code and and um, and recycling code <clears throat> so uh, when we recycle code um, we are finding uh, some code somewhere, probably on the web, and we are going to um, curate it in some way and probably make use of it. But um, oftentimes when we when we do that, if we're just copying and pasting, it may not work. We may have to do extra work to it. So um, for these boot camps, I definitely recommend um, typing everything. So the activity for everyone uh, even if you um, are a hardened R user, is uh, the exercises. Um, in fact, that's a way to test yourself uh, on these. If you if you have already used R for a little bit and uh, you don't think that uh, a page is going to be useful to you, by all means, skip to the exercises down at the bottom uh, of the page. And uh, you know, if you can answer all or most of them, you're probably okay to skip on to the other more interesting stuff to yourself. It's always one question to write your own new question, and uh, we'll make time at the end uh, for people to get through that. Now, when I write these questions, uh, I've done this kind of kind of exercise for years. I find it quite fun, actually, to write uh, little problems. I like doing problems, too. It's a little bit of a gamification of um, work uh, that's technical that involves data analysis. When I write questions, I always in my mind explicitly, I don't I don't do this implicitly. It's not something that I that I say and don't practice. I explicitly every time I write a question for an assessment or just for fun like this stuff, I think, is this going to be an easy, a medium or a hard question? And I I want to empathize with the um, the uh, audience for these. And 
I suggest here, the reason I have this create your own question in a beginner's R boot camp is I think if you if you think like that, if you've just consumed some material and you're tasked with uh, writing a question, it makes you think about the material in a different way, especially if you consider how hard it might be for someone and forces you to empathize, empathize with others. Um, and of course, the uh, questions that we work on have to be relevant to the page content. OK, so that's it for the um, slides. I'm just going to go back to the um, to the page here and just slide over to the boot camp page. If you're following along, um, it looks like that's a fixed width um, screen on this screener. So I can go back to the browser scene there. Maybe that's a little bit better. And if I uh, go in a little bit, the boot camp link will take us over to another GitHub web page where the boot camp lives. So I'm just going to click on that now. All right, and I'm, I'm only going to demonstrate um, just a little bit uh, on this. Most of this first page, the first day of the boot camp, is uh, to read and follow along at your own pace. And there isn't much um, code to actually type. Um, but I do want to point out that right up at the top, um, there's a script. So uh, what I would recommend you to do if you want to follow along is to right click it and, and save it if you're on Windows or in whatever fashion you like to do this sort of thing. Now I'm going to save it um, to a local page here. And I'm going to just download it and I'm going to um, open it straight up in um, in our studio and drag our studio over here. And I've got my script open. Now what this script is, is uh, what I recommend, the way I recommend doing these boot camp pages is to save uh, and make a script for every uh, boot camp page that you do, make a separate script. You can revisit back, and uh, if you find code that's useful, you can think of these scripts. Uh, if you keep the table of contents and the thing, now you'll be making your own table of contents after today, but this first script is a template script for you to use and recycle as you see fit. Um, if you haven't set up our studio and you you haven't um, haven't done this and loaded scripts before, this is the very first thing to do. You have to do this. And what will happen um, is that uh, under the contents, so I have one code block here. I think I demonstrated last week the couple of elements of syntax in the RStudio IDE that there's a, um, I'll just make this a little bit bigger for people and I'll, I'm gonna change this view just a little bit. There we go. Um, there is an element of the user interface over here on the uh, where my cursor is that's this this foldable button. So one function of the code chunk um, syntax is that we can fold a script that's long or maybe has a long complicated section as a way to slide through it and to hide code that we don't necessarily want to go. Also, if it's a very long section, we'll get to this trick later, but if we wanted to run a whole code chunk, and maybe the code chunk is big, maybe 100 or 200 lines long, if we um, if we fold it, we can select the whole code chunk when it's folded and it selects everything. So it's just a, a nice little um, utility, really, that's built in. But also, there are two ways to exploit the clickable links. Um, one way is to use this tab over here. I'm mousing over, moving my mouse here. And if I click on that, um, we can see a clickable table of contents that uh, we can exploit. It just moves the cursor to the script. And again, even if scripts are 50 lines long or so, 
this starts to be something I use all the time. Uh, and I get it out of the way if I'm if I'm not using it. The other th way we can do that is down here at the bottom where you see um, a clicked up here in the header chunk and it displays it gives us a visual display of what chunk we're in, what the title of the, the chunk is. If I click in header, now I'm going to click in the contents chunk and you can watch this area change three, two, one. And it changes and then I can click to the first um, content chunk and it will change again three two one I'm going to click so you can also click on that and navigate back and forth so this is the first uh, thing to do uh, in today's today's uh, boot camp <clears throat> okay are there any um, questions or comments here? Because we're at the we're at the point now where um, I would leave you to read through the boot camp, and uh, there's just a little bit of background. There's a clickable table of contents on this page, and uh, some of it is just reading. In this first one, there's not a lot of code. It's just introducing the syntax. Um, it explains the um, the headers. I think I'll just go through the clickable tables of contents. The first one is the um, example script that you should load up and examine the contents and fill in. Go ahead and fill in your own information for this time. Let's look at the second section. This is just a little bit of code on math operators. Now there are some instructions above this for you to actually type in this code in your template script just as practice and do some experiments. It's cheap, free and fast to do little experiments with using R as a calculator. I click back and we go to the third section. It's uh, logicals and how we code um, not only logical expressions, but just uh, the basics of um, um, true false expressions in R. Uh, then we have um, uh, this topic on R and the tidyverse. Um, for people that are just beginning, th this is one of the things that to me has emerged as one of the um, most, most frustrating challenges for new users. Here's the reason why. It's so easy, we all do it. If you have a question, it doesn't matter whether it's a, you know, what the, what the capital of uh, Bulgaria is or if it's something technical, we Google for it. We use the web these days. <clears throat> And there was a time some years ago, quite a long time ago, an embarrassingly long time ago when I started using R myself and um, I became aware of this online community that you could always go to and find help. It, it, I didn't always get answers, but just having that community there gave me a, a route that I could exploit. And that's been a um, one of the best things about um, learning R as a non-coder for many years. What has happened though, within the last five years especially is a, a new dialect of the R programming language has has evolved and it's um, it's collectively referred to as the tidyverse and the syntax for learning base R as it's called now and the tidyverse uh, are very very different there are um, there are two communities and um, the people in the tidyverse community are very passionate that their way is the best. The people in the base R community are very passionate that, that their way is the best. Uh, tends to be uh, that people who are already programmers um, or have had formal training in a, some programming language uh, tend to prefer the tidyverse. And it is very programmatic in that way. And it, it, it tends to be that people who don't have programming experience um, tend to prefer, pr prefer base R. The problem is that when you go to just randomly Google for help, that you will find resources for, uh, for both of them. And uh, they may or may not identify which flavor of R that they're using. Now this, probably the most important thing at this stage for you is to be aware that this um, dichotomy exists. And I've given you a link to uh, two of the, the people who are 
known for these arguments. One is an argument for base R. It's the optional reading I suggested in the link this week. That is, uh, this is by a, an educator who's a statistician who teaches extensively to non-programmers. Um, so in, in a lot of, I've known this guy's work for a long time in my own career, have a few of his books. And he teaches, I believe, at Stanford in the in the States. Um, and he's got a long teaching career. And he believes in his observation, and he's collected some data on it and written quite a lot about it, presented about it in conferences. He believes that base R is, uh, is easier for people to learn, easier for non-programmer students to learn, non-engineers. The argument for tidyverse, um, there, this is written by a younger person who isn't a, an academic, who's a data scientist, a very good and prominent data scientist. And uh, he argues that uh, the tidyverse is by far the easiest and best way to learn. So what I think I'm gonna do is just let you think about that. The most important thing for you to be aware of is that uh, both of those flavors of R exist. Um, I personally think that base R is, is easier, in my experience, seeing people um, learning. But uh, that has to be, uh, you have to think about this from the very first day that you're learning R these days, because you'll get both of these out there, and um, they're very different from one another now. Okay, and the last thing is the practice exercises. So um, when we get to those, these are pretty, pretty straightforward and we should be able to do these fast if we get onto it. That's all I've got. I already talked for longer than I anticipated. So I'm going to uh, stop this recording. Are there any questions before we launch into the boot camp? Any comments or questions? I see a comment here. What's the shortcut to zoom in and out of our studio? The um, the shortcut to zoom in and out, it's a fantastic um, thing to do. If you hold down control and shift at the same same time and hit plus, it will zoom in. And if you just hold down control and hit minus, it will zoom out. This is something that I use all the time, even when I'm just programming on my own. And if you ever forget that, uh, in the view drop down menu, you can zoom in and out and it shows you the uh, hotkeys for that. Zoom in is control plus plus <laughs> and zoom out is control plus minus. Um, LCD. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It should, uh, and, uh, at least uh, there should be a four clickable hash. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. If we if we miss uh, one of the hashes, is is it going to be linked to the list of contents, and one of the list of contents is gonna be missed out? Yeah, I mean, um, for a, I think this is this is a fairly high level tool, but I like to introduce it on the first day. And um, what I'd encourage you to do is play with the syntax. Like like I'm on the contents chunk here. You can see down here. And I've clicked inside the contents chunk, yeah. and we can see it up here. Just do a little experiment on your own computer. If we, uh, the syntax that is required for a clickable link is one um, hash symbol before some text, and at least four after some text. So if I delete one of the four after this, you can keep your eyes up here and watch it disappear. I'm going to click and delete one of them. Three, two, one. I just deleted one of them and it disappears and I can add it back and it will reappear. Three, two, one. There it comes again. Now over here, we only need one hash at the beginning of the line. As a matter of fact, that's that's the uh, R code for for uh, a comment. You just have it. It isn't recognized by the interpreter, by the passive aggressive butler as code if there's at least one hash. And uh, if I delete one of those, um, I still see that that syntax functions. So I have two hashes here just as a visual cue to myself that um, that, that is a new section, a new chunk. And uh, I, I use that as the beginning of a chunk 
just as a visual cue for myself. And if we delete the second one, three, two, one, boom, it uh, it takes it away and we can put it back. And I, I like to put two. There's another little bit of syntactic um, um, shortcut that if we go to the code section, we can see and it's the comment um, lines. Uh, let me see here. You come and edit, I think. Let me find it. Ah, there we go. Comment and uncomment lines. It's control plus shift plus C that I find it extremely useful. Um, you can you can remove one or two. <laughs> uh, it removes one at a time, I guess. So I have to add those back. But yes, that's the syntax. Uh, at least one of these at the beginning of the line, some text, and at least one after the line, or four after the line, rather. And I just have two at the beginning of these lines as a visual cue to myself. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you very much. OK, if there aren't any more questions, um, then the the we have some time. Let's uh, try to go through and develop our uh, code blocks on the boot camp. And I guess the uh, the very first section that um, that does it is this uh, this section one. Load up the script, run the code, type it yourself. Don't copy and paste. Um, or or if you're running out of time today and you want to work on the exercises with us, uh, go as fast as you can and, and plan to revisit it later. I'm just going to. Um, pause my own recording here, my own local recording. Uh, we can keep recording here uh, if we want to, and I, I'm going to work and develop this script in real time, and I'm just going to work, and um, you guys can follow along. I'd recommend if you want to do it yourself so that I'm not distracting you, uh, you can you can feel free to turn off my volume and, and come back if you want to, or you can, you can listen to me narrate as I go. So that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to use this um, trick that I've I've mentioned to you before about um, putting my R Studio side by side with uh, the web page so that I can do that. So I think everybody can see that now. And uh, I'm I'm going to focus straight on the code, but I'm going to um, read this section. And um, right at the top, it says uh, that we are looking at the header. And it says fill it in with your own information, which I'm just going to do. Now, I might want to keep this script 1.1 as a template. So I'm going to just go ahead and save as script 1.1-eh. And I'm going to fill this in. Okay, and um, the contents, I'm going to keep these the same because uh, the, in this script, in this template, I gave the exact uh, contents as they might appear for uh, this help page. And then the basic way to develop the uh, rest of the clickable sections, um, I've got the first one done for you. But when I go to make the second one, all I have to do is copy that next page, make a few spaces and uh, write the um, the rest of them, and now I get a new section. OK, so I'm just going to continue on. This is a little explanation of the syntax. Um, <clears throat> now, I do have this section on the help section in R, and I'm going to just put that down in the correct section. This is one of the... Um, very important components of R. It's a bit clunky, but um, it's uh, it is very important to learn. And if you look down in this lower right part, there's a help tab. We don't have to click on it. There is there. This is an old. I had this this set up this help page up for the data sets from maybe from last week. 
But if we execute this command in the in the same way that we learned last time, clicking somewhere on the line and in Windows, it's Control Enter is the hotkey. We get this uh, this help page. Now, if we look at the um, the web page, there's an explanation of all the sections in a stereotypical R help page. <clears throat> I'm quite aware that these um, help pages look absolutely terrible um, the first time you see one, but everyone is set up in uh, exactly the same way. And so it pays to invest a little bit in the components of them. The first component up here that I'll point out is that we have the name of the function and we have the package the uh, set of libraries uh, the set of functions in a library rather that that particular function is uh, based on now the boot camp does go through what a function is and how to use functions even how to write your own functions for now we can think of a function as something that does work usually their name implies the work that they do the function called mean um, guess what it does? It calculates the mean of some data. And uh, the description um, of it tells us that it's a generic function for the arithmetic mean. Uh, the usage section tells us um, um, typically how we use it. And if, if an argument name is listed here, if there is any anything listed here, uh, typically, we will have to provide information into the brackets of the name of a function to give anything. And uh, so here it says we need something called X. What is X? Well, we would look down in the arguments definition to see what that is. And and the X argument is just in our object. So we'll we'll test this out in a second. We'll talk about functions in the future. For now, the important thing is that if you need help on a function, we use the help function and we pass the name of the function that we want help with and it brings up the, the help page. We'll practice this loads uh, during the boot camp. OK, so you can read about that now. You want to turn me off or um, we can go on a little bit. There's an explanation of each of those and I just uh, sort of told you what they they were. Now. Um, the. What this little section does is it um, is it introduces the creation of a variable just with some trivial values, and uh, we're going to test out the mean setting setting the uh, x argument to a variable that we create. So setting x equal to my length. So I'm going to bring this up side to side so we can see it together. Close this. And uh, we're still in the um, section 1.1. And um, I'm going to um, go ahead and type this little section. And I'm just going to narrate it when I do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and type the comment as well. Um, try this code in your own script. I'm going to make a variable called my underscore length. You're already trying some R syntax. The assignment operator, remember, is the um, is the less than symbol and the dash. It's all one um, one character with no spaces. And then we're going to use the C function. That's the combined function that combines um, individual values into a vector. Again, we're kind of jumping ahead, and we will unpack all of this stuff later. But we're going to go ahead and use a function really quick 101 122 97 and um, a thing I like to to do is um, if I if I bring this out so that we can see our global environment up here it's empty right now have another metaphor I'll introduce to you in a future boot camp but um, one of the I think one of the challenges of learning are right in the beginning is that it's abstract in the way that it stores data as opposed to viewing a uh, an Excel spreadsheet that has a visual representation of it. Um, if we look up in the environment uh, here, there's there's nothing there, so we haven't we haven't actually run this code yet. But when I do. 
the variable called my length will pop up up into our global environment. And if we can see the variable represented up here, we know that it's then in R and we can access it through code. So I'm just going to do that now. I'm going to submit this three, two, one. Look at the global environment. There it is. This one is so small that we can see the length of it. It tells us that it's a numeric um, vector. It tells us that the uh, indices go from one to three. So there are exactly three values and it. It even gives us a view of the first few variables, uh, few, first few values. There's so few here that um, that it um, it went ahead and um, told us all of them. So I'm going to get rid of that. And then we're just going to calculate mean, the mean of my length. So to use that. Now I like to um, be explicit about the uh, arguments. So when we set some value inside a function, it is called an argument. And we're setting the argument called x to the variable that we want to calculate the mean of, which is my length. And uh, remember the answers come out down in the console. Um, so if I submit that, three, two, one. Uh, what happened then was that if I just make it a little bit bigger for you guys. My code was echoed down here and uh, the answer came out. We could do this in um, some other ways. You can, this is a thing that I find that is a little confusing to some um, people when they first start using this is that um, R was meant to be easy to use and learn as easy as possible anyway. Not that it is easy for people who have never had coding experience. And one of the um, one example of the barriers being lowered is that um, we, we actually don't have to do certain things like uh, when I made this variable my length, I didn't have to tell um, the R system that I was making a numeric variable. The interpreter just said, oh, you're passing some some numerals um, must be a numeric. This is the passive aggressive butler that's doing something for you most of the time helpfully, but sometimes we have to keep an eye on them. Another example of that is the use of arguments. So uh, for some um, for some functions like this, uh, we can be explicit about required argument names like this, but we don't have to be. Um, so I could I could have mean, and I could make some different numbers. All I've done here is I've passed a um, a vector with the combine function, and I've just put some numbers in there. I haven't specified x, and I can I can calculate the mean of those, and it will do that just just happily. So if you, we look down here, we get the answer just fine. And what he, what has happened here is again the butler has worked with us and said, oh, you put some numbers in there. You didn't specify x, but come on, you must mean you want me to calculate the mean of those things. So uh, this is meant to be easier, but um. I find it's a little bit of a double edged sword and I like to be explicit with all the argument names. Um, so if you catch me not doing that, yell at me and I'll, I'll be happy to put in the argument names. OK, so let's go on a little bit. Any anybody has any questions? Just yell. You can read a little bit about pseudocode. It's a skill that um, I used to not teach other people about it even though I've, I've had a little bit of programming training, formal training uh, in my past when I was a PhD student. Um, and one of the core skills that programmers use is um, something called pseudocode. And for many years, uh, when I started teaching our programming to others, uh, I didn't bother with pseudocode because I thought, oh, that's kind of a, an advanced skill that we don't need. My thinking has changed a lot on this. Uh, so oftentimes I'll come across people that have a kind of complicated problem. And what pseudocode is, is if you have a complicated problem that you don't know exactly how to solve, you don't have some template code to put on it, 
um, to, to test it out. What it is is we write the steps that could be used to solve that complex problem. We just write it in our own human language. Um, and then once we have that pseudocode, we can translate that into code that R will understand that can, can solve the problem. So it's just a conceptual way of breaking down a problem to smaller pieces. An example of that might be, um, what if you wanted to, um, what if you wanted to sort the numbers in a list of, of random numbers or any list of data into uh, increasing order? So uh, one way to do that, well, the first thing I might want to do is I might want to take the first element of um, a vector of numbers and I might want to compare it to all the other elements. And uh, whenever I came across one that was lower, I might want to take that one and compare it to every element. So you could you could develop pseudocode uh, to, to solve that problem. I saw a hand go up, LCD. Maybe it wasn't LCD's hand, it's still up. I saw something change and it just caught my eye. I think it's because we only have five minutes left. All right, so um, if we only have five minutes left, it implies I've been talking too much. <laughs> because <laughs> I haven't finished it myself. So uh, I'm going to I'm going to get through this code. Now we're on the math operators section. So I'm going to test out the plus sign. So we can do this in a lot of ways. 2 plus 5, get our answer is 7. Um, thing that I, I guess I would say here that I might demonstrate a little bit down below is that spaces between syntax don't matter in, in plain old R, but we do use spaces to help readability. So I could write, um, you know, 3 plus 2, 3 plus 2, and that'll, that'll evaluate just fine. R will just get it, but it, it's quite hard to read that. Um, subtract with a minus sign. Minus 15. Minus 5. Um, <clears throat> multiply with the asterisk. This would be a good time for you while you're going through this script formally to um, to um, m make notes for yourself that you can recycle later. So if you come across something that you think, oh, I might I might forget that later. That, that's something I don't know. It's a good time for you to set it aside. Note that I'm putting a space between these operators and the values, and that's just for readability. It's just um, that's a that's official R syntax. One space between um, exactly one space between uh, syntactic elements. Divide with the forward slash. Divided by four. and raise something to the power with the, um, I don't know what you might call that, I would call that the carrot or the hat. So that's how we raise something to the power. Now, um, this has a little example of, uh, so we can raise two to the power of three. We get our answer, no problem. We could also do fancier stuff like calculating the square root by raising something to the power of one half. <clears throat> Notice that, um, that uh, put in the square root function, anything that, is likely to be something that is work has probably been solved for you with a function 
sometimes you can just guess um, what those are. We'll do something a little more interesting uh, for that. And there are a few others, but basically you have enough to go on. And this is what your output should look like. It's approximately what my output looks like. Order of operation is uh, multiplication is and division are done before um, other operations. And you can control the order with parentheses. Um, now, we can um, look at this and we can see that it's done the, the uh, multiplication first from the answer. And if, if we explicitly control the uh, one, I see that the expression comes up two more times. I'm just going to recycle my own code. Now, I, this is a valid use of copy paste, recycling your own code. <clears throat> Test one is to uh, do we get the same answer if we force it to do the order of operations? And yes, we should. Yes, three, two, one, we've got it. And uh, what if we change it explicitly and we force it to do the addition first? We should get a different answer, three, two, one. And we do. Um, the thing up here is that I'll point out that the text is blue for the name of the file and there's a little asterisk it's unsaved and um, we um, will want to save that our studio is very powerful in the way that it keeps track of your save and even if we shut down or it, it crashed it rarely crashes uh, it's very stable but um, if it were to uh, it would save changes you had made most of the time but if we save it i'm going to do the hotkey control s there's a button you could click here, or you could come up to the file menu and click save. Any of those ways, we'll see that it changes three, two, one. And that's uh, that's basically us for time. What I what I suggest for next time is to uh, finish this um, and to uh, write a practice exercise. And um, what I'd kindly ask, if you want to go along with this as a group is if I could uh, ask everybody who, who will do this to give us your practice exercise in the Slack chat. Uh, I would like to do that. I'll, I'll, I'll do the same thing. I'll put one or two uh, in there in the coming week. And uh, if, if there are some, some good ones, uh, I'll probably just add them to this list. I, would like, I wouldn't mind growing the list of exercises that I have on the web page and we'll um, and if you have any questions as well, we can do that. I'm going to stop my recording. And I'm going to go ahead and ask for any questions that you have. Does anyone have any uh, comments or questions? Is that useful? Or are we going too slow? Uh, should, uh, should we pick up the pace? Do you want me to leave you guys to do it? How is this working for you? Can we go faster? Is it just about right? Anybody out there? I think it's okay. I think we're going to a good pace. Going at a good pace, okay. I'm happy to go at this slow pace. Uh, I find it relaxing. Um, I think. I think in the future, uh, I'll try to talk less and leave some dead time for you guys to try the code. And I'll be here as a resource rather than me talking the whole time. Or do you like watching me code? Can you can you vote in the chat? Yes or no? Why or in? Do you like it when I code? Do you like watching me code in these sessions? Or would you rather have some some time to do this yourself and then ask questions? Yes, you like Ed coding. Yes, everyone likes to watch Ed code. I do find it relaxing. I like to do it. I just want to make sure it's the best thing for you guys. Any any dissenting opinions? We 
accept all uh, opinions here. Would anybody like uh, some space? Let me know by email if you're um, if you don't want to disagree. And uh, even Peter likes to watch me code. OK, all right. If everybody likes to watch me code, I'm happy to do that. But we are out of time. Uh, can I say something? Yes. Uh, these exercises I've just started to think and these are really useful. Uh, I've started learning coding since September and it was really intensive at that time. But uh, if these classes were at that time, it would be really useful. But now at you are really good and I've learned so many new things because <laughs> uh, there are so many little uh, things which I didn't know earlier, but I know now. And the thing which I, which you said earlier about the tidyverse thing, um, I came across the tidyverse when I was doing my project in Birmingham, but at that time I didn't understand the difference between the basic R and the tidyverse. I was just uh, searching for the codes on the internet. So whenever uh, any code come across, I try to put it down. Or if, if it didn't work, then I try to modify it. But um, my question is. Um, uh, if you are writing a script and uh, you don't know how to code it and you want to search it on Google and you don't know it is in tidy worse code format or R format, does it work in the same code, both type of codes? That's a great question and I didn't mention the answer to that earlier. I, I should have, um, but it, it's a little too early for me to give a, a full blown explanation, but here's a here's a quick answer to that that um, with base R, when you, uh, a metaphor that I use is that it's like a, uh, it's like a garage and you might build some things in, in that garage. Like, and, and by building, I mean, we'll build an analysis together of, of data, right? Might build some graphs. And to, to do that, we need some tools in toolboxes. And base R comes with, um, an array of toolboxes and they're, they're already open and unlocked for you and already right there in the garage. Tidyverse um, does things a different way and the toolboxes are not in base R to start with. So uh, we would we would have to download um, the, the tidy box, the tidyverse toolbox, install okay. it okay. and load it. And usually it will complain like if you ask it for a function. So the, the tools are functions that we use. And uh, so one of the tidyverse uh, main tools. Well, we we'll test out a few of them in the boot camp if you stay with it till the end. But um, in short, it won't work if you just try tidyverse code in base R. You you have to you have to go that extra step and download the tidyverse. Now, but it, but if you have the tidyverse toolbox with the basic app, can both uh, code work tidy works and the basic R in the one if, script if you if you've downloaded the tidyverse you only have to do that once and yeah. if you load the libraries that code should work then yeah okay. it, sh okay. it should okay. work both of them will work and they'll okay. both work side by side okay it just um yeah we, we could try some um and we will try a little bit of a taste of it before the end but that, that's basically the answer oh right. thank you thank you Ant. you're welcome Okay, guys, that's it. Have a nice night. I see um, there was uh, Peter did mention he would like some space to code. So maybe what I will do if, uh, if there are some people who have been coding and some that are just starting is that uh, I will endeavor. I've, I've got mostly easy and medium questions. So maybe I'll come up with some uh, harder quiz questions. It takes a lot of time to come up with good quiz questions, but I'll try to have a a handful of them. If each of you would try to make one question, easy, medium, doesn't matter, and, and post it in the um, the Slack channel, we'll try to build up a, a bigger base. It's kind of fun to do questions, and, and maybe we could even experiment with um, starting these sections. I could assign, a, and you could read the, the page before we come, and we mostly spend our time working just on the exercises. Maybe we'll try that as a solution to uh, allow more coding time. But other than that, I'll see you later. Everyone have a good night.